uh, we've taken you all the way from the, the whole athlete all the way down to the single molecule. We're going to take you just one small step up now to the subcellular component of the mitochondrion. And to tell you about that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a junior faculty member in, in our own division here in cardiovascular medicine, uh, one of the leaders of the Wusai Human Performance Alliance Molecular Athlete Pro Program here at, here at Stanford, Milan Lundholm. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and hopefully, thanks for remembering my name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I work with you in for, for six years now here at Stanford. So, yeah, we work very closely together. Uh, and I'm extremely excited to be here today to talk about, well, my, my favorite uh, tissue is the same as Sylvia talked about before, muscle, uh, but also now going into my favorite organelle, which is the mitochondria. And uh, we need energy, of course, for optimal uh, performance. And to perform at this type of level, what you see here is Eliud Kipchoge, the Kenyan marathon runner and world record holder. Um, it requires immense amount of energy. And to do, to do this, you need, of course, to optimize your fuel storage. We need lipids, carbohydrates. Uh, we need to have an optimal breakdown system. Uh, and we also need uh, optimal delivery of oxygen because only aerobic metabolism can sustain this amount of, uh, uh, of energy um, uh, requirements for longer than a few seconds, basically. Okay, there we go. Um, and mitochondria that you see here are the organelles that are responsible uh, for, for most of the energy production in the cell. And I want to reiterate uh, what John mentioned before that just as exercise is medicine, uh, exercise is also mitochondrial medicine. So mitochondria are critical uh, for many of the benefits that we see. Uh, in uh, typical textbook examples, they're depicted at, at, as these bean-shaped structures. Uh, in, for example, muscle and heart that have a lot of mitochondria uh, because they are energy-demanding tissues, they also form very interconnected, more dynamic uh, systems that continuously undergo fusion and fission. And, and what's, what's really cool with these organelles uh, is that they are extremely plastic. So they adapt to whatever energy demands that are put on, on the cells. Um, so endurance training that Kipchoge was doing increases the, the mitochondrial uh, abundance, but also the quality. So we get mitochondrial biogenesis, increased quantity of mitochondria, as well as more efficient mitochondria. And this is known mostly from skeletal muscle, which is, of course, the working tissue. We need a lot of mitochondria there. Uh, but a lot of other tissues, we don't know very much about what happens with, with exercise. So mitochondrial function improves with training. But at the other end of the spectrum, mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with, uh, for example, aging age-related de decline in mus muscle function, as well as other diseases such as type 2 diabetes uh, and uh, Parkinson's disease. So there's a lot of interest in, of course, improving and maintaining mitochondrial function uh, throughout life. Um, and we use different uh, large-scale uh, technologies to look at the, the sort of multi-omic uh, effects of training on mitochondria. Um, so we look at uh, gene activation, uh, protein expression, post-translational modifications, epigenetics, etc., uh, in order to try and build a whole picture of uh, an elephant, or in our case, uh, hopefully an athlete's. Um, and what we want to do with all of these different ohms is to use more of a systems biology approach to try and build maps of what actually happens when we train, uh, to learn more about the mechanisms behind uh, uh, adaptation to training and how we can reach optimal performance. Uh, and as part of the uh, Molecular Transducers of Physical Activity Consortium, uh, we have uh, looked at this in, uh, in rats. So we've taken rats, trained them uh, for up to eight weeks and looked at 19 different tissues uh, and looked specifically at what happens with mitochondrial uh, adaptation in, in these rats. Uh, and here you see a uh, pretty complex figure about all the mitochondrial uh, analytes that change with training. Uh, at the top there, let's see if I can get this. Over. 
Uh, at the top here, you see the, the transcriptome, so gene activity changes across all these 19 tissues. So at the bottom here, you have the tissues, and then you have the ohms. So we, we have transcriptome data from all of these 19 uh, uh, tissues. Uh, we also have metabolome, although unfortunately it's not there, uh, but I can show you later if you're interested. Uh, we have a proteome from a little fewer tissues, seven tissues of all of these. Uh, and what's interesting here is we have some tissues that don't respond very much from a mitochondrial adaptations perspective, like the brain, kidney, spleen, et cetera. And then we have some tissues that, that respond a lot, like for example, uh, adrenal gland, colon, uh, heart, liver, skeletal muscle. Uh, what we can also see is that, for example, in the liver, we don't see much mitochondrial response at the gene activity level, but we do see a lot of mitochondrial protein abundance changes, as well as uh, post-translational modification changes. And for each tissue, uh, we can build these, these maps, these multi-omic adaptation maps of what happens uh, with the, the uh, mitochondrial changes over time. And what you see here is actually for skeletal muscle, for an ex as an example, because I know that a lot of people in the audience are very interested in skeletal muscle. Um, so we, what we do is we, we look at this time course of changes from one week, two weeks, four weeks, and eight weeks of training. Uh, we divide it up into uh, different sexes. So you have female, male, in this case it's upregulation, and then you have both the sexes here. And what we saw in skeletal muscle was the main trajectory of mitochondrial changes increase over time. The nodes here you, you see are correspond, the size corresponds to number of, of analytes that belong to that node. Uh, and then we see the, uh, the path here, the color, corresponds to the ohm. So what we see is that the main mitochondrial changes uh, in skeletal muscle with training over these eight weeks are driven by protein abundance changes. And if we look at what these proteins are, they're mostly related to fatty acid metabolism, which is great for Kipchoge because you know, lipids are the most uh, energy dense uh, fuels we have. Uh, and uh, eventually, we can hopefully also incorporate, for example, nutrition, as Sachin mentioned, as well as you know, time of day of exercise, uh, sleep patterns, et cetera, other factors that will definitely impact uh, these different molecular maps of, or, of changes. So that's something that we're looking forward to continue to collaborate with all the different parts of the, the, the alliance. Um, so how do we take these multi-omic findings and to learn more about me mechanisms behind how this can improve metabolic function in athletes? Obviously those were rats. Um, so one thing that we do as part of the Wutsai Human Performance Alliance is that we take human skeletal muscle from athletes that have performed one bout of exercise, either uh, endurance or resistance exercise, and these are both endurance and resistance athletes. Um, and then we uh, do muscle sections. So here you see a, a section of a female high-level athlete with the type one fibers in blue, so the endurance fibers and the type two fibers in red. And we do spatial proteomics. So we targeted, we look targeted at the metabolic proteins that move across the cells. So metabolic proteins that are affected in mitochondria, how they translocate from the mitochondria to the nucleus and affect gene activity. So that way we can look at the interplay between metabolism and gene activity to finally understand more about how the intricate interplay between metabolism and gene activity occurs and the mechanisms behind how an increase in metabolic demand can actually translate into an altered protein profile in muscle that we saw in the, in the rats before. And as it turns out, mitochondria are also really cool because they have their own DNA. So they have a circular DNA that's a remnant from their evolutionary history as uh, uh, bacteria a long time ago. And another project that we have within the Alliance is that we're looking at elite endurance athletes. So these are really, really high level aerobic athletes. They have VO2 maxes of, you know, I think the average right now is over 70. So for those of you who know, they, that's very, very high. 
Uh, and we're looking at whether, whether variants in the mitochondrial DNA can also affect aerobic performance. And I just want to uh, promote uh, poster 21, where Alex uh, will be after uh, the next keynote as well. Um, but optimal performance can look different depending on who we are and where in life we are. But functional mitochondria are critical at all stages. And we want to understand how what mitochondria adapts to training through these multi-omic changes, uh, how different mitochondrial metabolic proteins can directly translate into gene activity and protein abundance changes in mitochondria, and of course also how, how genetic variation can, can affect uh, elite aerobic performance uh, through these different, uh, different projects. And I want to thank, of course, the, the Wutsai Human Performance Alliance uh, for, for this, this opportunity. And I really, I'm really excited and look forward to future collaborations. Uh, and it's really, really exciting to see all of the alliance, uh, all the new members and all of the trainees. And I really hope you come talk to me after if you're interested in collaborating on any of these. And also mention a few people. Uh, UN, who can take over, and, <laughs> and also uh, David Amar, who's worked with me a lot on this. Thank you. Thank you.